NASA SLS may never get off the ground and never mind sending an astronaut to the moon. This is just predictions made by many experts, but you and I can't deny that it may be 80% correct when we look back at what this rocket's done. So why don't we use SpaceX Crew Dragon to the moon instead of NASA's gigantic rocket failure? Let's find out the real reason for this in today's episode of Alpha Tech. Back in March of 2019, Vice President Pence challenged NASA to land astronauts on the moon by 2024 by any means necessary. NASA's response to Pence's challenge was to proceed with what it already had in the pipeline, the Orion crewed spacecraft and the massive shuttle-derived SLS space launch system, the heavy-lift expendable booster rocket. Sadly, SLS has been in the slow walk development since 2006 with more than $23 billion spent. The rocket will not be able to send humans to the moon until at least 2026. And more pitifully, SLS can't deliver Orion to low lunar orbit like Apollo with enough propellant to fly at home. To fix that, NASA wants to build a new space station in high lunar orbit, which it calls the Gateway, to provide Orion with the destination it can reach. But to travel down to the moon and back or up to the high Gateway orbit requires a lander with double the propellant needed from low orbit. The Rube Goldbergian plan has been contracted for SpaceX Starship HLS. Too cumbersome, too expensive. This is definitely a big disaster that many people are finding an alternative. So in that case, the contract that resulted in the Dragon crewed spacecraft was issued by NASA in 2014. Six years and $3 billion later, it's flown astronauts into orbit for the first time. So far, what SpaceX did was show that a well-led entrepreneurial team can achieve results that were previously thought to require the efforts of superpowers. But is Crew Dragon capable of replacing Orion? In theory, Crew Dragon has a dry mass of fewer than 10 tons and 50% more internal space than the Apollo capsule that carried three astronauts to the moon. SpaceX's Falcon Heavy rocket has the capacity to lift Crew Dragon and return stage into lunar orbit. There, the vehicle would dock with a lunar lander that would carry the crew to the surface while the Crew Dragon capsule remains in low lunar orbit. After sciencing on the moon, the astronauts would use the lander to return to the Crew Dragon, fire the return stage, and come home to Earth. It would be a tight fit for four people traveling for three days to the moon and three days back, but a Gray Dragon probably would be roomy enough. The two primary advantages of the scenario are cost and potentially speed. NASA now spends in excess of a couple of billion per year on development costs for Orion and the Space Launch System. For this amount of money, NASA could procure several Crew Dragon spacecraft and Falcon Heavy rockets to launch them. Well, the cost comparisons are extraordinary. According to an independent assessment by the Planetary Society, NASA has spent a total of $23.7 billion on the development of the Orion spacecraft, which is designed to take up to four astronauts into deep space for 21 days. By comparison, the commercial crew program, NASA has invested just $1.7 billion in Crew Dragon, which has already proven itself. Then, there are the launch vehicles. NASA is approaching a total investment of $23 billion in the SLS rocket, which likely is still months or longer away from its first orbital test flight. Importantly, the rocket is expected to cost at least $4 billion per launch. By contrast, SpaceX paid for the entirety of Falcon Heavy's development, and it would likely cost NASA between $150 and $200 million for a lunar launch. Using SpaceX's capsule and rocket could also get NASA to the moon by 2024, because they're now sending astronauts to ISS. In contrast, there's no guarantees that Orion, a stripped-down version which made a test flight in 2014, and the SLS rocket can pass upcoming flight tests. So why wait on the more expensive government vehicles when commercial solutions are already at hand? Well, NASA Administrator Bridenstine was dismissive when asked about using Dragons instead of Orion for the Artemis program. I think it's important to note that Crew Dragon was specifically designed for low Earth orbit, and in order to send it to the moon, it would require a ton of modifications, he said. I'm not saying you couldn't modify it, but if you modified it, it would look a lot like Orion. Another consideration is that Falcon Heavy is not rated for human launches, meaning it doesn't include some safety factors that would increase its reliability. However, NASA could solve that problem by launching a Dragon separately on a Falcon 9 and propulsion module on another Falcon 9. They could then dock, a procedure NASA perfected during the Gemini program more than a half century ago, and proceed to the moon. Regardless, do you think NASA will agree to this if Dragon can really be fixed to reach the moon? Definitely no. After all, it's just because NASA doesn't want it because of the politics that's behind SLS. For many, it sounds like a straightforward argument. 
Just cancel the slow and outdated SLS and direct the $2.6 billion per year into novel public-private partnerships like SpaceX, which promises to revolutionize access to space. Now imagine this argument from the perspective of a congressional representative from Alabama, home of SLS. First, cancel the SLS and lay off tens of thousands of constituents, then take the money that was previously allowing voters to have good income, mortgages, and a sense of pride from a high-status project, and give it instead to California and Texas where SpaceX is located. Yeah, they're going to laugh you out of the room. This is the core dilemma for those who want to end the SLS. How do you make a politically viable alternative? The answer must involve building a new coalition that's stronger and more motivated than the one currently invested in the status quo. And this tends to be quite difficult and historically requires a major external event to predicate massive political change. The SLS could suffer a catastrophic failure, and that's what ultimately ended the space shuttle program. Or maybe a series of dramatic political realignments will significantly reduce the influence of regions that most benefit from the current program. Or perhaps the incentives themselves could change. NASA's already transformed its approach to new programs through fixed-price commercial partnerships that better control cost and reward performance. However, none of these provide clear paths for those who wish to stand against the SLS. The reasons why NASA has the SLS remaining is far more compelling than the reasons to not have it. And meanwhile, on the eve of the first launch, NASA is readying a long-term contract securing upwards of 24 SLS rockets through at least 2036. The political support for the SLS remains steadfast and it's likely to continue. For those who find this distressing, consider this. The lawmakers that make up the SLS political coalition are jealously defending the interest of their constituents. And isn't that the entire point of representative democracy? I mean, there is and will remain tension in the U.S. political system between local and national interest. Ideally, local interests align with national interest. And until there's an alternative to the political dynamic that represents the foundation of the SLS coalition, perhaps the best path forward is to focus on making the program more efficient, more capable, and more effective in achieving its goals. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Don't forget, share your ideas in the comment section down below. Everyone's support motivates us to create more quality videos. And for that, we thank you so much and hope to see you next time.